Well, good morning. Hey, uh, this morning we're going to go ahead and jump back into the book of Acts. And we're going to be in chapter 3, beginning there this morning. And uh, uh, really, I would love to go through chapter 3 pretty much uh, in its entirety in one sitting, but that would probably be uh, about an hour's worth of podcast. Not that I can't go for an hour. I mean, uh, brevity is not a gift I have. But uh, it takes forever to download videos that are like longer than about 20 minutes. So really what we're going to do is take the first 10 verses or so and then break it down uh, uh, each chapter 3 into a a couple of different uh, uploads. And so that being said, we're going to go ahead and start by looking at chapter 3 right there in verse 1. And if you remember, uh, the, uh, the church was now beginning to grow. Peter has shared his first sermon and, uh, and uh, um, th- about 3,000, uh, maybe just men, may have been m- many more than that, came to Christ on that very first day once the Holy Spirit was uh, poured out upon those believers in the upper room. They came out speaking in tongues and glorifying God in these languages, and that got the people's attention and gave Peter the opportunity to uh, share what became the first sermon, really, in the church age. And so um, a tremendous response as the Holy Spirit convicted and cut to the hearts those who had heard, and they ultimately came to repent and believe. And so that being said, now the church is growing. They're centering around the the, the apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking bread and prayers, and uh, glad, gladness and simplicity of heart going from house to house, and, uh, and the Lord added daily such as should be saved. And so that's where we left off last time. And so now the church, uh, uh, um, you know, some debate whether the church is born here or in Acts chapter 9 after Paul uh, uh, comes to Christ and begins his ministry. Not my uh, intention to really uh, pick at that too much. There's some merit to both arguments. Um, But I like to sort of encompass this in basically the church age because now we begin to see New Testament believers, those filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, now going forth and growing in their faith and propagating their faith. And so Peter here in chapter 3, uh, it says, uh, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the, thir- at the hour of prayer, the, the ninth hour, or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, and a man lame from birth was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, and uh, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Now the Beautiful Gate is, uh, the location of the Beautiful Gate is the subject of some discussion. Uh, because of the description of where it is, it's right around, as we'll see, Solomon's uh, uh, porticos or Solomon's porch. Uh, it likely is the east gate of the temple, or the, uh, if, if you're familiar with how the temple is laid out, it is laid out so the main gate of entrance is on the east. So if you're looking at a view of the temple and you see the east gate, uh, that uh, means, or the beautiful gate, or sometimes called the golden gate, but it is, um, it is on the eastern wall of the temple. And it is through there that you would enter and you would be able to go straight into the temple from there. And a number of events take place in that area. But um, but what we see here is that this is the location where this takes place. Now, what's unclear is if this is taking place right there at the eastern gate, or if it's taking place a little bit further in, right before the entrance to the, the temple uh, proper in that uh, which is known as the Nicanor Gate. And so we're not sure where this took place. There are some Jewish um, regulations that might prohibit him from being inside the temple area at this point, being a man lame from birth. And so it's likely that he is begging for alms here at the very outer gate, the Eastern Gate. Now, what's significant about the Eastern Gate, if this is where this is taking place, again, there's some dispute about where this may actually be happening, but it seems pretty clear that this is the location, the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate is also the gate uh, that uh, Christ entered into en route, uh, ultimately, uh, or I should say exited out of in that, and en route to the going to the cross. Uh, it's also the place where he will return and enter into, and uh, the Muslims, being aware of this, have actually sealed up the Eastern Gate. It's concreted shut, um, as if that will stop him. But it's, but it's basically an affront to uh, the idea of Christ returning in that area. And so uh, the Eastern Gate is a significant place. And so uh, just to give a sense of geography where this is taking place or where it's likely taking place. Um, And so he's asking alms to those entering the temple. And seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter, alms being like offerings, monetary offerings and that. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. 
In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw uh, saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Uh, wow, right? Here's a guy who's lame from birth. He's unable to do the very thing that he now begins doing. He can't walk, much less leap and dance. And so he's someone who has to be carried into this area. And he's, it's done so for him every day so that he might beg. And people begging in the temple area uh, were not uh, uncommon. It was not an uncommon sight. We saw this happening during the Gospels as well. Um, but here now, Peter and John are walking through the area in the temple of, uh, in the hour of prayer, uh, likely just being available to what God may want to do. It turns out that because much of the church, uh, well, at this point, pretty much all of the church was were Jewish, ethnically, Messianic Jews at this point, um, uh, you know, their congregating times when they would gather in, in uh, uh, I should say maybe a better way to put it is when they would, um, when you would want to um, gather as believers in the, in the area, sometimes you'd gather in the temple area. I mean, they met from house to house, but it was not uncommon for Paul, for Peter and John here we see, to go into the temple area, uh, both as believers and maybe to congregate with other believers who are sort of now new in their faith, but they were still in the habit of going to the temple, but even more so, those who were Jewish and were not believers in Messiah, in Yeshua HaMashiach, that Jesus the Messiah, and they would go there to engage. Uh, we see this, again, extremely uh, 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 regular practice of Paul, where every time he'd go to town, practically, he would first go to the synagogue and begin to reason with the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Well, we see that sort of uh, prototypically here with Peter and John. The church is just now uh, been born, and they're now going into the area, and they're very likely going there in order to, um, you know, because they would as just their general practice, but also to be available to the Lord. Uh, I'm not reading too much into that, but it does appear that as soon as they get in there, there's an opportunity, and they take it. And so, and it's kind of remarkable, the opportunity they take, because, you know, it's one thing to go and to try and preach Jesus in, in an area and hope to see God work. It's another thing to see a guy who's been lame from birth, uh, who they likely recognized as having been there many, many times, Peter and John, that is. And, and he, Peter asked, tells the guy to get up. Now think about that for a minute. Put yourself in his sandals. Uh, how ready would you be to tell somebody who is crippled from birth to get up, rise, and walk? That is remarkable. And it, it, you know, it's, it's, there is the faith of the man who is trusting as they tell him to, that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this man no doubt had heard of Jesus, had maybe even uh, hoped that Jesus might heal him at some point. But here is uh, Peter and John come there, and, and they, in the name of Jesus, tell him to get up and walk. And the man had to believe uh, that he was going to be able to in order to even try. But before we can get to that, think about the faith of Peter and John, right? It's Again, it's one thing to preach and hope to see God work and to bring results through the Holy Spirit, taking that, that word uh, and, and implanting it in the hearts of the listeners. It's another thing to be bold enough to uh, invite a crippled man to get up and walk. That was a big deal. And it definitely, you know, Peter in that moment was no doubt prodded by the Holy Spirit to step out and to say this to the man. And the man got up, and he not only walked, but he leapt up. He got up, and as soon as he realized he had the strength in his legs again, or as, you know, with the parts of his body that had been uh, lame, he gets up, and he begins to just jump up and down, and just, you know, in, in just absolute uh, uh, joy, just praising God for what just happened to him. And the people begin to gather around because they've seen this, and they're amazed and wondering at what's going on now in their midst. And so, um, something I'd like to park on for just a moment. Uh, when we see miracles in the New Testament, when we see the apostles, uh, Peter, John here, Paul later, Peter elsewhere throughout, um, you know, this is something that Jesus had told them that they would have the authority to do. He sent them on a missionary trip early on, uh, earlier, I should say, during his own ministry with them and leading them. He, would, he sent them on... Uh, missionary journey to go and to uh, to heal and to bring the gospel of the kingdom and to uh, to cast out demons and all of these different things and they came back with a report 
of being able to do those very things. Well, now Jesus wasn't walking with them in the same way anymore. Again, he would never leave nor forsake them. He's with them always. Even in this moment, though they can't see him, he's with his church. He's with his believers. He's with his followers. And But they're on their own now, in a sense, physically speaking. Jesus is not there to touch the man and to raise him up. And so instead, Peter and John now, in the name of Jesus, they command him to get up and walk. Uh, and the response to that was understandable. But know this, that uh, we're going to get to it next time more fully as Peter begins now to preach based on this miracle. But it's in the name of Jesus that he heals. Uh, he is calling upon the Lord himself ultimately as the object uh, whose attention we should, uh, who's, uh, who, where our attention should become fixated upon. And it's in his name and really for his glory that this miracle happens. And, and this is what I wanted to speak to you for just a moment, because um, there's, when it comes to miracles, there, there are a lot of angles that we uh, could speak to this about. First and foremost, the, fact, the, the question, do miracles happen today? Something like this, could it happen today? I'm of the belief that it not only can, but does. Uh, you can uh, very easily find reports of people being healed, not only uh, sort of in the faraway reaches and, and, and those kinds of things, but even... You know, even in, in our Western culture, we see that God is still working in that way from time to time. Um, as to why it may, maybe doesn't happen more or it happen less, I don't really know the answer to that per se. People can speculate and throw their hats in on that. Um, but the fact is God does still do that. Do that. He does still bring healing. Um, so that, that question to me is not a question. I think that God still certainly can, but not only can, but does. Um, the other thing, though, too, is miracles themselves as sort of a matter of, uh, of, of amazement. The idea that a miracle would be done to simply amaze people around, to demonstrate something incredible happening in that. Uh, we see later on in the book of Acts, we'll come to it, where people actually want to buy uh, the, the gift that uh, Peter uh, has and stuff, and Peter rebukes him in that um, because he wants to be able to have the power of God working through him in that way. Um, <clears throat> we should not, you know, on the one hand, we are amazed at miracles. When something happens where somebody's healed, uh, where sickness is healed, or, um, or someone's on the brink of death and God brings them back, or maybe someone even has died and they're brought back, uh, something very dramatic, that naturally has an impact on us. But it's important to recognize that miracles in the New Testament are not intended to just simply be uh, a wow thing for in and of themselves. They have a purpose they have, a, they have a purpose in the purposes of God, and that is to be in connection with the gospel. Remember, here at the very outset, it's in the name of Jesus, which means that who Jesus is, we think about what he's done, uh, his, his, his being God, all of these different things are in that name, Jesus, right? And later on, after the miracle happens, uh, Peter will then immediately begin to preach the gospel. He'll begin to preach about Jesus. In other words, the miracle was not the end in itself. The miracle, as incredible as it was, was really just a, uh, a way to open a door for the possibility of an even greater miracle. And if we really think about it, as incredible as, uh, as any miracle could be, there is no miracle more important than the miracle of a changed heart, of a person whose, uh, whose heart was dead in sin and that heart being replaced with a heart that that beats for Jesus, you know, and is suddenly now someone is born again. That is the greatest miracle of all. It may not be the most sensational looking from what we see, but think about the time when Jesus uh, healed the man who also was lame. He was a quadriplegic. He was not able to to move himself around, and uh, uh, and and this man's uh, these four guys lowered this guy down in front of Jesus inside of a house, and and Jesus takes the opportunity. Um, to use it as a, a teaching lesson to demonstrate who he is. He asks the Pharisees who are there in the crowd, who are there looking for a chance to trip him up. He says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or rise up, take up your bed and walk? And of course, the answer to that, the easier thing for people like you and I to say, normal people, would be your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because there's no evidence required, right? You could, I could say that to you. And miracle, okay, but there's no real verification of it. We just... You know, you'd have to take my word for it or not, right? But if you say, rise, take up your bed and walk to a man who can't rise, take up his bed and walk, well, if that doesn't happen, you've just sort of invalidated yourself. You've even maybe made a fool of yourself. 
Well, so Jesus in that instance says, well, just so you know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, I say to you, saying to the man who's uh, lame on the, on, the, on the stretcher, essentially, rise, take up your bed and walk. And so he does. And the point of that was that Jesus was, well, first he said, your sins are forgiven you. And of course, they're aghast at this because only God can forgive sins. And that, of course, is the point. And then he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. In other words, he did the physical miracle so that everybody around would recognize he could do the greater miracle, and that was a forgiving sin. And so when someone is saved, that's a far greater miracle than any physical healing could ever be. But at the same time, the physical miracles accompany the gospel message so that entrance might be given for the gospel so that people might be saved and the greater miracle take place. The point I make is simply this. Having said all that, this is what I'm really saying, is that when we see miracles in the New Testament, they are a means through which to bring the gospel. And today, typically, when we turn on a TV and see a faith teacher and those kinds of things, it's not really about the gospel. It's about the show. It's about this person having the power of God and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it, it ends up making a mockery of what's really important. And, and frankly, whether those miracles even take place or not uh, is obviously subject to some pretty serious question. And so, um, but the proper place of a miracle is to stop us in our tracks and cause us to recognize that God is working in that moment. But it's ultimately to help bring about the gospel. And this is what we see Peter doing in this moment. As a matter of fact, even in the first sermon, the miracle of speaking in tongues and languages that they didn't know and people understanding and hearing them praising God in that led to the opportunity to preach the gospel. And we see that pattern happening often in the New Testament. Uh, it's important to recognize that really the gospel is the central thing. It's not just the miracle. We do pray for them. We should. We want to see God work. We want to see people healed. We want to see uh, all of these uh, different ways in which God can bring uh, a miraculous event to pass, but we should always remember that the miracle for the sake of the miracle is so far less than what the ultimate purpose uh, is. And so that being said, uh, I'm going to stop right there today, and then next time we'll go ahead and, uh, um, you know, if, uh, next time we pick up an Acts, we'll go ahead and pick up right there in verse 11 and, uh, and cover some more ground there. But it's a really exciting book in the book of Acts. This is the beginning of the, the church's move into the world, as we'll see in the chapters to come, that they'll actually start becoming recognized as those who are turning the world upside down. Uh, and uh, as uh, Greg Laurie would often say, it's not actually turning the world upside down. The world's already upside down. It's actually turning it right side up again. And so it's, uh, it's a powerful thing to see. And, and I don't use that word lightly. It's, it's really exciting and very powerful to read how the church in, in the first century was. And the reason we do that, by the way, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the previous uh, episode, is because we want to glean from this. Uh, it's my personal belief that the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more like the first century church is the modern church going to become. I think, uh, while I do certainly believe there's a place for big churches and all of that, I think the practical nature of very large churches is going to become a very difficult thing in the days ahead. It's going to be hard to support that kind of thing. And I think the smaller house church kinds of things, the smaller uh, gatherings, are going to become much more the norm. They already are moving that way, but I've, and I've been saying this for years. I've been kind of watching this happen and realize that, you know, I think this is where we're headed. I think there is uh, something of that uh, first century kind of approach to gathering in the name of Christ that's going to become characteristic of our day in the soon coming days. And so um, so it's, it's helpful for us to look at this and to learn from it, to glean from it, uh, to seek the Lord in the same way they did, and we might even be surprised to see God working in many of the same ways uh, today as he did then as we move in that direction. So we'll see what happens in the days to come. I'm not claiming to have a word from the Lord on that. It's just kind of my sense of observation. But, um, but we'll see, right? But uh, all right. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the days in which we live, which are truly exciting as well. And Father, as believers, we want to uh, see you working in our day. Uh, especially as we draw closer and closer to Christ coming to bring us home. We just want to see you work in, in many of the same ways for the same reasons. Uh, Father, we want to see people healed. We want to see the sick brought back and the dead brought back to life. We want to see sight restored and all of these kinds of things, Father, not for themselves, but that we might have opportunity in your working these things out to then share the gospel and to let those miracles validate the truth of the message that we bring. 
Father, we know that your word will go forth and accomplish that which you set it forth to do, whether there's a miracle or not. But there was a reason why you did that in the first century. And we don't want to be afraid of seeing you work that way today. But Father, help us to be rooted and grounded in your word. Help us to understand these things for what they are. And help us to seek you in the same ways that they did then. Father, that we would too, like them, make sure to, uh, that our, 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 our Christian lives are built around your word and fellowshipping together, breaking bread together and praying together uh, as we look forward to your coming. Father, we love you. We praise you and bless you. And uh, we just ask that, God, you would just guide the steps, uh, our steps in front of us. Just lead us in the ways you would and help us to bring you glory in the days ahead. Father, thank you. We praise you and bless you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you have any questions or thoughts or observations or anything like that, I always like to welcome that. So uh, go ahead and feel free to comment on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can uh, click on the link to our website from there where you can also watch the videos. And you can email me from our church's website as well, calvarychapelfranklin.com. You can also watch these videos and contact me and comment on the videos from my personal website. And that's parsonspad.com. And, uh, and if you'd like to listen to the audio podcast, you can subscribe to it from parsonspad.com as well and listen on your favorite podcasting outlet. So, um, all right. Well, God bless you, and we'll look forward to catching up next time. Thanks for joining, and thanks for watching as always. I totally appreciate the fact that we can spend this time in the Word together, and I pray that God blesses you as you walk with Jesus. Amen. <laughs>